we will uh, continue our lecture on logistic regression that we uh, introduced in the last lecture. And if you recall from the last lecture, we modeled uh, the probability as a sigmoidal function and the sigmoidal function that we used uh, is uh, given here. Um, and notice that this is your um, hyperplane equation. And in n dimensions, um, this quantity um, is a scalar uh, because you have x elements, uh, n elements in x and n elements in beta 1 and um, this becomes something like beta naught plus beta 1 1 x 1 plus beta 1 2 x 2 and so on, beta 1 n x n. So, this is a scalar and then we saw that uh, if this quantity is a very large negative number, then the probability is 0 and if this quantity is a very large positive number, the probability is 1. And the transition of the probability at point 5, so remember I said you have to always look at it from one class's viewpoint. So, let us say if you want class 1 to have high probability and class 0 is a low, prob low probability case, then you need to have a threshold that we described before that you could convert this into a binary output by using a threshold. So, if you were to use a threshold of 0 0.5 because probabilities go from 0 and 1, uh, then you notice that this p of x becomes 0 0.5 exactly when beta naught plus beta 1 x equals 0. This is because p of x then equals e power 0 divided by 1 plus e power 0 which is equal to 1 by 2. Also notice another interesting thing uh, that this equation is then the equation of the hyperplane. So, if I had data like this and data like this and if I draw this line, any point on this line is the probability equal to 0 0.5 um, a point. That basically says that any point on this um, line in this 2D case or hyperplane uh, in the n-dimensional case will have an equal probability of belonging to either class 0 or class 1, which makes sense uh, from what we are trying to do. So, this model is what is called a logit model. Let us take a very simple example to understand this. So, let us assume uh, that we are given data. So, here we have data for class 0 and data for class 1 and then clearly um, this is a uh, two-dimensional problem. So, the hyperplane is going to be a line. So, a line will separate this and in a typical case in these kinds of classification problems, this is actually called as a supervised classification problem. Uh, we call this a supervised classification problem because um, all of this data is labeled. So, I already know that all of this data is coming from class 0 and all of this data is coming from class 1. So, in other words, I am being supervised uh, in terms of what I should call as class 0 and what I should call as class 1. So, in these kinds of problems typically you have this and then you are given uh, new data which is called the test data and then the question is what class does this test data belong to. So, it is either class 0 or class 1 as far as we are concerned in this example. Just to keep in mind that where would we use problems like this, remember at the beginning of this course I talked about fraud detection and so on where you could have uh, lots of records of um, uh, fraudulent uh, let us say credit card use and all of those uh, instances of fraudulent credit card use you could uh, describe by certain attributes. So, for example, the time of the day, uh, whether the credit card was done at the place where the person lives, uh, credit card transfer or uh, credit card use uh, was done at the place the person lives and many other attributes. So, if those are the attributes, let us say many attributes are there and you have lots of records for uh, normal use of credit card and some records for fraudulent use of credit card, uh, then you could build a classifier which given a new set of attributes that is a new transaction that is being initiated could identify what likelihood it is of this um, transaction being 
fraudulent. So that is one other way of thinking about the same problem. So nonetheless, uh, as far as this example is concerned, what we need to do is we have to fill this column with zeros and ones. If I fill a column with a row with zero, uh, then that means this data belongs to class zero and if I fill it one, then let us say this belongs to class one and so on. So this is what we are trying to do. We do not know what the classes are. So just so that we see this, it is a very simple problem. Um, uh, we have plotted the same data that was shown in the last table and you would notice uh, that uh, if you wanted a uh, classifier, uh, something like this would do. Um, so, um, this problem is linearly separable, so you could, you could come up with a line that does it. So, let us see uh, what happens if we use uh, logistic uh, regression to solve this problem. So, if you did a logistics regression solution, then uh, in this case, it turns out that the parameter values are these and how did we get these parameter values? These parameters values are got through the optimization formulation where uh, one is maximizing log likelihood with beta naught, beta 1 1 and beta 1 2 as decision variables. And as we see here, um, there are three decision variables uh, because this was a two dimensional problem. So, one coefficient for each dimension and then one constant. Now, once you have this, then what you do is you have your uh, expression for p of x, which is as written before the sigmoid. So, this is a sigmoidal function that we have been talking about. Uh, then whenever you get a test data, let us say 1 3, you plug this into this uh, sigmoidal function and you get a probability. Let us say the first data point when you plug in, you get a probability this. So, if you use a threshold of 0.5, then what we are going to say is anything less than 0.5 is going to belong to class 0 and anything greater than 0.5 is going to belong to class 1. So, you will notice that this is 0, class 0, class 1, class 1, class 0, class 0, class 1 class 0, class 0, class 0, right. So, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, what we wanted was to fill uh, this column and if you go across row, then it says that particular sample belongs to which class. So, now what we have done is we have classified um, these test cases, which the uh, classifier did not see while you were identifying these parameters. So, the process of identifying these parameters is what is usually uh, called in machine learning algorithms as training. So, you are training the classifier uh, to be able to solve test cases later. And the data that you, you use while these parameters are being identified are called the training data and this uh, is called the test data that you are testing a classifier with. So, typically what you do is if you have lots of data uh, with class labels already given, uh, uh, one of the good things uh, you know that one should do is to split this into training data and the test data. And the reason for splitting this into training and test data is the following. In this case, if you look at it, uh, we built a classifier based on some data and then we tested it on some other data, but we have no way of knowing whether these results are right or wrong, right. So, we just have to take the results as it is. So, ideally what you would like to do is you would like to use some portion of the data to build a classifier and then you want to retain some portion of the data for testing and the reason for retaining this is because the labels are already known in this. So, if I just give this portion of the data to the classifier, the classifier will come up with some classification. Now, that can be compared with the already established labels for this data points, right. So, from uh, verifying how good uh, your classifier is, it is always a good idea to split this into training and testing data. What proportion of data you use for training, what proportion of data you use for testing and so on. Uh, are things to uh, think about. Um, also, there are uh, many different ways of uh, um, doing this uh, validation as one would call it uh, with this data. Uh, uh, there are techniques such as k-fold validation and so on. So, there are many ways of splitting the data into train and test. Uh, 
uh, and then verifying how good your classifier is. Nonetheless, the most important idea to remember is that one should always uh, look at data and partition the data into training and testing so that uh, you get results that are consistent. So, if one were to uh, draw these points um, again uh, that, that we use this in this exercise. Uh, so, these are all uh, class 1 data points, these are class 0 data points and um, this is your hyperplane that a logistic regression model figured out and these are the test points that we tried with this classifier. So, you can see that in this case everything uh, uh, seems to be uh, working well, but as I said before um, uh, you can look at results like this in two dimensions quite easily. However, uh, when there are uh, multiple dimensions it is very difficult to visualize um, where the data point lies and so on. Uh, nonetheless, um, so it gives you an idea of what logistics regression is doing. It is actually doing a linear classification here. However, based on the distance in some sense from this hyperplane, uh, we also assign a probability uh, for the data being in a particular class. Now, there is one more idea uh, that we want to talk about in uh, logistic regression. This idea is what is called as uh, regularization. The idea here is the following. If you notice uh, the objective function that we used um, in the general uh, logistics regression, which is what we call as the log likelihood objective function. Here theta again uh, speaks to the um, uh, constants in the hyperplane uh, are the decision variables and this is the form of the equation uh, that we saw uh, in the previous lecture and, and in the beginning of this lecture also I, I believe. Now, if you have n variables uh, in your problem uh, or n features or n attributes, then uh, the number of uh, decision variables that you are identifying are n plus 1. So, one constant for each variable and a constant. If this n becomes uh, very large, when there are large number of variables that are present, per, then uh, what happens is this logistic regression models can overfit uh, because there are so many parameters uh, that you could tend to overfit uh, the data. So, to prevent this, what we want to do is somehow uh, we want to say though you have this n plus 1 decision variables to use. Uh, one would want uh, these decision variables to be used sparingly. So, uh, whenever you use a coefficient for a variable for the classification problem, then we want to ensure that you get the maximum value for using that uh, variable in the classification problem. So, in other words, if let us say there are two variables, I say beta naught beta 1 1 x 1 plus beta 1 2 x 2. Then um, for this classifier, I am using both let us say variables x 1 and x 2 as being important. Uh, what one would like to do is make sure that I use these only if they really contribute to the um, solution or to the efficacy of the solution. So, one might say that uh, for every term that you use, you should get something uh, in return or in other words, if you use a term and get nothing in return, I want to penalize this term. So, I want to penalize these coefficients. This is what is typically called as regularization. So, regularization avoids building complex models or it helps in building non-complex models, uh, so that your overfitting effects can be uh, reduced. So, uh, how do we penalize this? So, notice uh, that what we are trying to do is we are trying to um, minimize a log likelihood. So, what we do here is we add another term to the objective and uh, lambda is called the regularization parameter and this h theta is some regularization function. So, what we want to do is when I choose the values of theta 
to be very large, I want this function to be large, so that the penalty is more or whenever I choose a variable right away a penalty kicks in and this penalty should be offset by the improvement I have in this term of the objective function. So, that is the basic idea behind regularization. Now, this function could be of many types. Uh, if you use uh, this function to be uh, theta transpose theta, then this is called L2 type regularization. So, in the previous example, this will turn out to be uh, theta would be beta naught beta 1 1 beta 1 2 transpose times beta naught beta 1 1 beta 1 2. So, in this case h of theta will become beta naught squared plus beta 1 1 squared plus beta 1 2 squared. Now, there are other types of uh, uh, regularization that you can use. Uh, you can use this is what is called a L2 type or L2 norm. Uh, you can also use something called an L1 type or an L1 norm. And larger the value of this coefficient that is multiplying this, uh, the more is regularization strength that is you are penalizing for use of variables lot more. And uh, one general rule is uh, regularization helps the model work better with test data because you avoid overfitting on the trained data. So, that is in general uh, something uh, that uh, one can um, uh, keep in mind uh, as one does uh, these kinds of problems. So, with this the portion on logistic regression uh, comes to an end. What we are going to do next is um, we are going to show you an example uh, case study. Uh, where logistics uh, regression is used for a solution. However, uh, before uh, we do this case study, uh, since all the case studies uh, on, uh, on classification and clustering will um, involve looking at the output from the R code, I am going to take a typical output uh, from the R code and there are several results that uh, will show up. Uh, these are called performance measures of a classifier. Uh, I am going to describe uh, what these performance measures are and how you should interpret these performance measures once you use a particular technique uh, for any case study. So, in the next lecture, uh, we will talk about these uh, performance measures and then following that will be the lecture on um, a case study using logistics regression right so thank you for uh, listening to this lecture and i will see you in the next lecture